Ever wonder what it must be like to have an astronaut as a parent? Well, last year, Patrick Mullane, the son of astronaut Mike Mullane, released a fantastic book called The Father, the Son, and the Holy Shuttle. So we asked them both to join us to tell us more. Plus, we'll get you up to date with all the happenings in the world of spaceflight. And as always, please do get involved with us on our social networks. We're at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And we love hearing from you. We really do. And don't forget to hit that share button if you enjoy what you hear. But right now, please enjoy episode 67 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 67 of our podcast. Let's get started right away. On Monday night, Emily and I had the privilege of having a chat with former astronaut Mike Mullane and his son Patrick to talk through some of their memories of what it was like going through all of that during the 1980s. You may remember that Mike joined us on the podcast way back on episode 27 to discuss how best to support and encourage women within the space industry alongside Christina Corp. He was selected as an astronaut as part of the class of 1978 and flew in space on board the space shuttle three times, STS-41D in August 1984, STS-27 in December 1988, and STS-36 in March 1990, uh, following which he retired from NASA. In 2006, he released a book called Writing Rockets, The Outrageous Tales of a Space Shuttle Astronaut, which is essential reading for anyone who is interested in the space shuttle and that era of space flight. Absolutely. Now, his son, Patrick, also released a book in April 2020 called The Father, Son and Holy Shuttle, Growing Up an Astronaut's Kid in the Glorious 80s. I love that book title. It's a fantastic <laughs> read, which takes a completely different look at what it's like uh, in Houston in the 80s, surrounded by families connected to NASA in some way, shape or form. He's now an executive director at Harvard's Business School Online, having spent 20 years in various business management positions. Although prior to that, he was also a captain in the U.S. Air Force. This interview has a little bit of everything, so we hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Okay, here we go. Welcome, Moulains, <laughs> uh, Patrick and Mike. The dynamic duo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. So, Mike, what led you into spaceflight? It starts very early in my life. I was uh, born three weeks after World War II. My dad was a World War II aviator. I grew up in the shadow of World War II when they were a very young age, very impressionable young age for a boy to be seeing all these Hollywood movies about the heroics of our World War II airmen. And so that combination made me at a very young age to want to fly, to want to be a pilot. And I mean young, I'm talking five years old, maybe as soon as you can have it, have a sense of what you want. So uh, that, that's what when I had this focus on aviation and as I got a little bit older, they started these movies on, on uh, these Hollywood movies on astronauts going to, uh, to other planets, destination moon, uh, forbidden planet, you know, some of these others. And those hooked me big on space. And I was really into space before Sputnik was even launched. I was 12 years old when that happened. And that basically was the time at which I knew that I positively wanted to be involved in aviation and rocketry in, in some way. And so my life was set there on getting an engineering degree. Uh, the things that I wanted to do, uh, the education that, that was required, ultimately fit very well with applying to be an astronaut later on, you know, getting a master's degree in aeronautical engineering, flying in the backseat of fighters in the Air Force. So I had a resume that was very competitive uh, in 1970 seven or so when they announced they were going to select the first group of space shuttle astronauts. So that was my pathway. I guess they announced the new astronaut class today and it was like 12,000 applicants and they selected 10. The ratio is a lot worse than uh, your class <laughs> was. Yeah, I know. Uh, I heard they had like 8,500 applications and selected 35 for us. And I imagine a lot of those applicants, well, actually both 10,000 and the and the 8,500 for our group, I'll bet a lot of those weren't, uh, they may have applied, but not have been remotely qualified. Uh, but I'm sure there was hundreds that were very, very competitive. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's funny when you think of it, it has a, I, I have to believe it has a lot to do with, uh, you know, a modern communication area where era and, and marketing effectively, when you look at a SpaceX launch and social media and the cheering that's going on and Hawthorne when something launches and the documentary on the Inspiration4 crew, uh, but there's a lot of people who saw those things all of a sudden are interested in, and back in 77, none of that existed. By the way, yeah. it looked to me on the ages of those, it looked like they were older than our group. I was 32 when I was selected, and I think uh, uh, maybe you guys have it in front of you. I know Donna read to me, wife read to me the resume on a couple, and I think there was a 47-year-old, was there a 47-year-old colonel? Is that right, Donna? Yeah, a uh, 47-year-old colonel and uh, 40, I don't know. It just seemed to me that once she read off sounded older than what our group was. Hey, your son's 53. Let's not be uh, calling those people old. <laughs> yeah, there's hope for me. Yeah, there's hope for me yet. All right. Patrick, uh, I believe you were born in, what, 1968? Mm -hmm. When did you become aware that your dad had a different kind of job? That he wasn't, you know, he didn't have a nine to five where he sat at a desk type of thing? Obviously, I was well aware of what he was doing before he was selected as an astronaut because I was 10 years old when he was selected as an astronaut. But um, as you know, it's something I write a lot about it, but it was very it, like my dad, I think as early as I knew what a vocation or profession was, I was aware of what he was doing and immediately globbed on to that because I, I kind of idolized what he did. I, I idolized the culture. I loved everything about it. Um, you know, dad often talks in our family gatherings about how we would, um, when we lived in England, I think it was, he would take us out to, you know, to the perimeter fence of a runway and he'd have a stand behind a, you know, formation of F4s and afterburner, which were probably roasting us. <laughs> <I remember. laughs> they certainly were loud um, and just loving everything, um, everything about that. And I also mentioned, you know, being in, in an officer's club, or excuse me, being in a, um, in a commissary on a base and, and you see in those days, only men, um, walking around in flight suits um and i always thought it was kind of cool to think wow where were they just you know an hour ago um that that just seems so adventurous and romantic in a way so i was very aware of it uh, very young a story there about going out to watch the f4s take off at alcaberry that's in the united kingdom uh, american nato base at the time uh back when i was there we would go out there at night and the perimeter road allowed us to park very very close to the to where they ran up their engines to take off. I mean, real close, probably within, I don't know, 150 feet uh, or so. And when those J79 engines and afterburners would lit off, uh, particularly at night, you have this giant uh, red blue tail, you know, shock waves forming in that exhaust out there. And it just would shake. I was doing this old VW and it would just shake that VW, just rattle it. Kids would just scream, scream. They just loved it. So it was a, it was a heck of a fireworks show to watch that at night. All I can think of, Dad, is you say about 150 feet away. So since Emily's a, a naval person, a former naval person, all I can imagine is, you know, even on an aircraft carrier, they put that deflector up. Uh, you know, if you stood... <laughs> If you sit 150 feet behind an, uh, you know, an F-14 or an F-18 taking off, probably blowing off the back of the deck <laughs> without the deflector. Yeah, honestly, I I think I went to Vultures Row a couple times to see flight ops, and I never went to the flight deck because they always told us, like, we don't want pit, like idiots who are under the ship like you on the flight deck because <laughs> you'll get killed. Because yeah. seriously, they would have people come up there and just diddle around, and it's like, when flight ups is going on, it's it's quite dangerous. So I yeah. never went up there. I was I was too of a too much of a chicken to go up there. I didn't want to get like hurt or something. I did go to an air show once, and I I, forget, I don't even remember what plane it was, but it was like I swear to God, it like maneuvered right by me, and I could feel the heat, and I was like, oh my God, man, I'm losing my face today. I thought <laughs> it was gonna burn my entire face off. It was. It was kind of awesome, but whatever. So, Emily, to answer your question, since I was like five years old. <laughs> okay. A follow-up to that, though, Patrick. You said that you were 10 years old when your dad got announced as an astronaut. At that point, did you feel like it was a cool job? And did that dissipate within a year or so? Because obviously it was a while before he got his flight. And by the time he then flew, were you over it? How, how did that pan out for you? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was very exciting. Like I remember it being a big deal and he was in the papers cause he and, uh, I think it was Dick Covey, right. Was stationed with you dad at right. Brooklyn. So, uh, yeah. they both were selected. So the local papers, you know, 
but this isn't like it's the New York Times, right? It's some small paper in a uh, in Fort Walton Beach um, area wrote about it. Um, but uh, it, it's funny in my mind, it was much, going to be much more grandiose than it ended up being because you know, like my father, I was kind of influenced a lot by the pop culture of the time and television at the time, and I was a big fan of I Dream of Jeannie, which. You know, anybody who grew up when I did, um, that was the show you watch when you're homesick from school, um, you know, after Gilligan's Island and the Adams Family, kind of the, the whole <laughs> list. And Barbara Eden as Jeannie, I had a huge crush on, crush on her as a 10-year-old, and she hung out with astronauts. So I had this vision that we'd be living in this mansion, I think probably in Florida, <laughs> because that, that show duped everybody into thinking, you know, you're going to be in Florida if you're training to be an astronaut. And that, you know, Barbara Eden would be my best friend. That sounded awesome. Um, <laughs> that didn't materialize. <laughs> uh, hey, I, I thought she'd be my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Donna's over here shaking her head. <laughs> that is funny. So you wrote in Writing Rockets, this is for Mike, about, you know, when you first came to NASA, it was the first. It was the first astronaut class that had, you know, a diverse set of members. You had women in your class. It was the first time NASA had ever had women. And you also had a few African-American astronauts and you also had the first Asian-American astronaut in your class. Can you tell me a little bit about what the culture was like, you know, then and probably how it would be a little maybe a little bit different now? Because right, honestly, I'm sure. <laughs> I've done a little bit of reading and honestly, I think NASA adapted pretty well to it back then. I mean, that's honestly what I think. Yeah, no, I, I hate any problem there with the women were not the women's fault. I should back up. I certainly brought a very misogynistic attitude toward toward women in the workplace in the in the in the world of aviation and rocketry because uh, not that this is an excuse, but that's the way I was raised. Uh, I went to twelve years of Catholic school, which was very uh, misogynistic in the sense that women had a, a very narrow function in the world, and that was to be mothers and bear children or to be a nun. Uh, uh, things like that. In the yearbook, you don't see that women were going to be uh, CEOs or engineers or they were going to be typists or clerical people or uh, secretaries, that type of thing. So that was the world I came out of. I didn't have any feminine influence in my life. Uh, my, I had uh, five siblings, one sister and four boys. So uh, the, the fan and my mom uh, was tough as iron. I mean, she had more, I used to joke, she had more testosterone in her than I did <laughs> because, uh, my dad was in a wheelchair from polio. So she was raising these five boys and the daughter, uh, you know, with the major player, the, the husband and confined to a wheelchair. So she had to be tough. And so I came out of that combination of, uh, my family and my religion with some archaic views toward women in the workplace. So when I got to NASA and saw these women, my first sense with what are they doing here? They're, you know, they're not qualified. Why are they here? That type of thing. Now that changed over the years. I've certainly changed significantly. In fact, I've changed absolutely to the other <laughs> other extreme in the sense that I love it when I see that uh, women are high achieving in any area. That's I want full empowerment for everybody out there. That's the way to America will be the best it can ever be. So I'm certainly have made a huge change. But at the time, uh, I look back on it and, you know, we treated, and I wasn't the only person. It was kind of in the military male community had a lot, a lot of shared, uh, same sense of, uh, you know, women in the workplace in the, in the high tech, in the high performance rocket world. But yeah, I changed and, uh, and I'm glad I did. Uh, but certainly, you know, at the time I, I look back on, it, I felt really, really bad about how I acted around the women. In fact, to the extent that in my retirement, I wrote an apology letter. I intended to write it to Sally Ride, and uh, she unfortunately passed away. I, I wasn't even aware she was sick, and I woke up to the news she had died. But I still was determined to do something in way of uh, apology. So I wrote her partner, Tammy. I forget her Tammy's last name. But anyway, I, I wrote her uh, the letter that I intended for Sally and just said, hey, I wish I could have, Sally could have read this. And but anyway, I, I definitely changed. But at the time and for many years, and I talked to him at this in my book, Riding Rockets, I was definitely uh, a caveman when it came to women. Uh, the the African-American, you know, that never registered on my radar as any, any issue at all. That's one thing about the Catholic religion. They may have been in the dark ages with women, but they were light years ahead in race. So I came out of that with a very good attitude about African-Americans and other uh, ethnic minorities in, in the country. All right. 
to me, as somebody who was a kid during the early shuttle era when it first started flying, I mean, that was such a cool, exciting time. I mean, there was just so much hope that the shuttle would be, you know, the wave of the future, that we'd it'd go up every two weeks. Obviously, that never happened. But just summarize sort of the excitement of that time and sort of the, you know, what it was like to train for your first mission. I tell you, the, when it was really exciting was in the year or so before Challenger. We had two shuttles on the launch pad, two of them. And I think there was, I, I can't remember, I should, I need to look it up, but I think we launched two shuttles in the space of, you know, just a couple of weeks there, uh, you know, back to back off different launch pads. It was, it, it reminded me of the movies, you know, there was going to be these spaceports and these rockets are going to be flying all the time, basically where we are now. Uh, but it was uh, just such an exciting time. Everybody was in training, you know, their admissions were coming faster and faster. And of course, that ultimately is, is the root cause of Challenger is people were trying to do so much with so little and they started taking shortcuts in the process. But, um, you know, it was a, it was an awesome time. Very, very exciting. I was over the moon excited to be on my first mission on all of them, actually, on all of my missions. I was living the dream. I mean, in every every sense of that expression, I was living the dream and, and everybody else was, too. Uh, well, were you, Patrick? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it, it was it as crazy or exciting for you? The, uh, but and was there a split pre and post Challenger as well for you in, in how you viewed it all? Uh, I get the question a lot about the Challenger kind of inflection point in the in the program, and I can say really um, with a lot of clarity that it, it made no difference to me. Meaning, I was just as worried before Challenger. <laughs> as I was after. And I, I come on this a lot. I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I had come from uh, an aviation family where friends of dad had been killed flying airplanes. Um, I remember uh, when I was at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, there was a, a guy killed in an F-4 while we were there. And I remember hearing about it and, you know, hear people talk about it at school. It was kind of, you know, a traumatic thing. Because they're small communities, particularly a place like Edwards at the time, which are kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And so, um, you know, I'm proud to say that I had a kind of a, a pretty sound logic as a kid, which was this, is that if an airplane can kill you and it's got a complexity on a scale of one to 10 of a four and you're flying a space shuttle, which has a complexity on a scale of one to 10 of 30, <laughs> then the, the chances something bad are going to happen are that much higher and that it's eventually going to happen. In fact, Dad and I were talking about this recently, um, you know, and it's true today is that if you think about it, it the, if you are launching a lot and you're not having accidents, you're going to keep launching a lot. But if you keep launching a lot, you're eventually going to have an accident. And it'll happen It'll happen with what we're doing today. I mean, it's inevitable, um, just as airliners crash, you know. So certainly over time, as with airliners, the risk has been so significantly reduced just to be very, very manageable. And I would expect in space travel that you'll eventually get there. But I, I would argue we're probably, you know, a century away from that. It's just It's just that much more complicated. But, uh, but no, I didn't have any more reservations afterwards or less before because of that experience growing up a military brat. I do wonder, and I don't know because I've never talked to any of them, that if the kids from the civilian families had a different impression. I've never heard anybody comment on that, never had a chance to ask anybody. I, I just don't know. I, I would echo, uh, I guess I didn't address when I was talking about the excitement of the, of the uh, Halcyon days of uh, the shuttle. I tell you, I was terrified sitting on that launch pad on all three of my missions. Challenger did not change that fear factor for the reasons Pat just uh, enumerated there. And that is, you know, flying in military aviation, a lot of a lot of friends were killed doing that. And uh, if that can happen to them in, a, in an airplane, it's certainly, you know, sitting on a shuttle, which particularly that what made me <laughs> scared on the shuttle is there's no escape system, no mm -hmm. ejection seat, no pod, nothing. Uh, whereas on a fighter, uh, it was a lot easier to swallow back the risk. You're sitting on a great escape system, an ejection seat. Uh, so it was a lack of an escape system that really played in my brain sitting out on that launch pad that this thing has to work. It cannot fail uh, because we have no options of bailing out of this thing. That, that, that really, really ramps up the fear factor. And frankly, that's why you now people ask me now, would I be uh, frightened to get on a SpaceX or a Bezos rocket? And absolutely not. <laughs> I would uh, be much more comfortable on those in the cockpit of one of those than I was on the shuttle because they have very robust escape systems, those uh, capsule escape systems. Virgin Galactic, I'm not so sure about that. As, uh, as far as I know, they have no powered flight escape systems. So uh, I'd probably still have a little white knuckle time on 
on a Virgin Galactic. Mike, on, on a day like today, do you keep up to date with what's going on in the astronaut office or just generally in space flight? And then when something like today happens, when there is a new astronaut announcement, do you get any nostalgic feelings or twinges of excitement or does it take you back or have you, are you completely detached from it now? No, I, I tell you, I'm, I don't stay, I don't talk to, I rarely am talking to any astronauts, either my classmates or, you know, once, once in a while I exchange an email with somebody, but it's not really a lot. I'm not involved in that and I don't follow exactly what, I mean, I, the astronaut selection, you know, that was news, but I'll tell you when I heard it just a couple hours ago, it was. It was a really. I was. I was surprised at what a kind of a pang in my in my uh, <laughs> soul there. But I looked at Donna when they when she started reading these names. And I said, "You realize you're na- you're reading the names of people who will walk on the moon. Some of those people are going to walk <laughs> on the moon." Uh, now I still wonder about Mars. It, it may be the. You know, I know NASA is happy to say the first person to walk on Mars is alive today. I'm. I can be real skeptical of that when I look at the immense challenges that are ahead for for that mm. and the amount of money that it's going to take. Uh, but certainly some of those names that were pronounced today will set foot on the surface of Mars, uh, uh, the moon. And that really just really hit me. I mean, gosh, that, you know, I was thinking back to that day that I heard and how just over the moon happy I was, even though I was still skeptical <laughs> that they made a mistake. Uh, I talk about that in my book, uh, in my book, Riding Rockets, about how I figured uh, that they're going to wake up and say, hold it a second. How did this guy's name get read? There's a typo here. But uh, at any rate, uh, yeah, it, it affected me today in a, in a very positive way, in a nostalgic way. You know, I wanted I wanted to be young again. I wanted to be them. I wanted to be here in this. I wanted to be looking forward to, to my rocket ride and, and getting on the moon, you know, that type of thing. One thing that's been uh, that was cool about that announcement today is uh, my son, who's 26, works for SpaceX and he works in the flight surgeons group and he is uh, going to medical school next year and he has aspirations to become an astronaut. Well, his boss was one of the guys selected today. It's kind of cool to, you know, third person twice removed, be um, <laughs> be connected to it in, in that way. Um, but his name is Anil and he, he actually uh, was in the, uh, the Inspiration4 documentary. He's got some pretty prominent scenes in there. So it's kind of cool. And my son certainly is excited about it. I bet he takes a pay cut. <laughs> and I'll bet he doesn't care <laughs> going to work. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> sure. So how do you feel about that then, Patrick, that you may be the, the generation that missed the opportunity to go? <laughs> <laughs> I get questions like that all the time, too. Actually, I'm trying to convince, you know, after watching the Inspiration4 video, I told my son that he needs to write a note to Elon and say, look, how about having you, me, and your grandfather go on a mission <laughs> together? Wouldn't that be cool? A three generations on on one mission? I did say, though, one stipulation I'd have is only about a day and a half. I don't want three days. I'd probably open the hatch and jettison my dad after all his dumb jokes for for, uh, <laughs> for three days. But that said, I think it would be kind of uh, kind of fun to do. Um, no, but you know what's funny is I, I have gotten the question, um, not related to my son, but I, I'll never forget this. And my dad's heard this before, but I was the, uh, before I'm in the job now, as the CEO of a manufacturing company here in Massachusetts. Um, and it, it wasn't some huge publicly traded company, but a couple hundred people. And my sister, my younger sister at the time, had written a book that was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. And I, I was talking to a buddy of mine about this, and he's kind of shaking his head, like looking sad. And I said, you know, that's a weird reaction to this. I thought it was kind of cool. He says, no, he said, I, I feel bad for you. And he was, he was semi-serious. He's like... <laughs> Your dad's an astronaut and your daughter, or your sister rather, got nominated for a Pulitzer Prize and you're the CEO of this crappy little company in the middle of Massachusetts. I said, how does that make you feel? I said, well, I didn't feel bad until now. <laughs> now I just don't feel pretty bad. <laughs> in, in all seriousness, I one thing that my dad did for me that was very, and both my parents, was very helpful. I never had the sense that there's this expectation I had to live up to. I mean, other than being a, you know, trying to be a good human being and all that, but um, and and I, I have a story in my book, um, The Father, Son, and Holy Shuttle. I should mention the name because dad's good at doing product placement there when he mentions his book. <laughs> I mentioned that um, a, a really good example of that is that when I was trying to decide where I wanted to go for college, uh, I had an appointment to West Point. My dad went to West Point. And I was tempted to go there, not because um, not because dad went there necessarily, but because um, I wanted to go in the military. It's it's not an easy place to get into. It was an honor to be accepted or appointed. 
And I'll never forget dad, as I'm kind of thinking through what I want to do, saying to me, look, if you want to go to West Point, um, you go to West Point, but don't go because I went there. And I think he, he even said, it's hard to believe, but that I, it, the bar was low, I guess. That I'm more mature than he was at, his, at my <laughs> age. And that, um, that while it was good for him, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't something that's necessary for me. So, you know, don't feel pressured. And, and that, you know, that's a huge relief on a kid to not feel that pressure. Um, I, you know, as, as I said, I don't know that would have mattered if he said that to me. I think I would have still made the right, the, the same choice I did, which was go to a, a civilian college, but do an ROTC scholarship, which here in the United States, as you may know, is just a military scholarship to go in the military after college. Um, but he never, he never pressured me. And so I never, I, even to this day, I've never felt like, oh my gosh, I'm, mm. I'm a, dis am I a disappointment dad? Maybe I should ask. <laughs> <laughs> I was at a, at a uh, one of the family reunions once with all the kids there as adults. Uh, one of them, I think it might've been your sister, Laura, you know, kind of teasingly looked at me and said, kind of serious says, dad, which of your kids do you love the most? No, uh, <laughs> actually, that's not the way the story happened. I'll tell it if you want. <laughs> well, okay. Well, maybe you're talking two different stories, but the one I, I was asked something about to compare my children and my reply was, they have all disappointed me equally. <laughs> so, That's what I remember. <laughs> obviously, jokingly, you know, my kids are very proud of all of them. Seriously, though, I feel like I'm the bad cop of the interviewers today because I'm asking some of the serious stuff. Um, seriously, Mike, you wrote a, a, an op-ed, uh, I think a few months ago about um, there's a lot of civilians going to space now. When I say civilians, I don't I mean non-NASA astronauts. That's what I mean. You talked a lot about, you know, risk and things like that. And, you know, you talked about how you were sort of haunted. You know, you didn't know if Chris McAuliffe understood the risk right. involved in Challenger or not. So what do you what are your thoughts about, you know, non NASA missions and, you know, how popular they're getting? I mean, Blue Origins sent in some more people up, I think, in the next week or so. What do you think? Well, I, there's a couple of questions I think embedded in that. One of them is titling them. I've been asked, do I get offended by having it? To a title astronaut uh, given to like Richard Branson uh, or uh, Captain Kirk, uh, you know, those guys. And, you know, my answer is it really doesn't matter because the press is going to label him an astronaut. It doesn't really matter what I think. I have no problem uh, with that. As long as nobody at NASA gives out NASA astronaut pins to people who might fly a, uh, uh, on a, on a ride to the space station, for example, on a SpaceX or something, I, that would, Disappoint me. I think the astronaut pen itself, which is copyrighted, it's the shooting star through an ellipse, very simple, elegant. And that's given to every ast astronaut, not given. <laughs> you have to pony up $400 because it's made out of gold, but it's presented to you after your first flight. Uh, or in this That's how it was when I was an astronaut. And uh, wait, 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 wait. They made you pay for it. Yeah. The government, the government, it's not going to pay for, for something like <laughs> I that. I didn't know that. I did not know that. It's like getting an Olympic gold medal and then the, the guy giving it to you asked for a check. Hey, I flew in space and all I got was this crappy t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I did uh, not know that. Wow. Yeah. No, you pay for the, you pay for the pin. At any rate, they present it to you. It, it's flowing into space uh, with you. So uh, that's a big, big, big deal. And I would hope that someday if we, you know, if Matthew McConaughey goes up on to film a movie up on the space station, I hope to God that NASA does not give him a NASA astronaut pin. I have no problem with SpaceX giving people pins and whatever the design they want, whatever title they want. Uh, I, that doesn't bother me. I just I just want that what, you know, what we earned back in the in the early days, uh, you know, from Mercury on. And God knows those guys really put their Heinies on the line riding those uh, primitive rockets. So uh, I think that ought to be something that's reserved entirely to people who are selected by NASA as NASA astronauts. Absolutely. Uh, as far as that blog I wrote about the risk, uh, we kind of touched on that. Pat was talking about it. At the time, it was right before Bezos was flying um, Shatner and those folks. And, and uh, was that one or was it the... I think it was the inspiration. It might have been the inspiration for, but yeah. It might either that or it was the uh, or the Virgin Galactic flight. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, it might have been that one. But at any rate, I made the comment. It felt to me like reading the press. It was back right before Challenger when when everybody is just over the moon excited that Krista McAuliffe, a school teacher, is flying on Challenger. And, and nobody's talking about the risk. And I would see her. I didn't know her at all. I've met her once and, you know, just we were ships passing in the in the astronaut office, everybody had their hair on fire running around training for missions. So 
but I'd seen her many times walking by me and she always had that incandescent smile. That was her hallmark. She just, you could just see it. She was already weightless in my soul. I would say, I hope to God, somebody sat down with her and told her that this is not a flight on an airline. And she really needs to think it's the most dangerous thing she's ever going to do. And she really needs to balance that with the family. And, you know, and I'm sure she would have said, Hey, I'm all in. I understand the risk. I'm going to, I'm going to fly. Everybody deserved to know from the mouth of somebody like an astronaut uh, saying, this is dangerous, Krista. You need to think about it. It's not just a cake, a piece of uh, ride in the park or any other, uh, you know, euphemism you want to use. It's, it's dangerous. And uh, I later learned through the Netflix uh, documentary that Dick Scobie, the commander of that mission, had actually brought the question to his wife, June. Uh, telling him how concerned he was is that she seemed to be unaware about the risk and whether he should sit down there and talk to her. And they discussed it. And, and he did. Uh, uh, according to that interview, uh, she went back. He went back and sat down with her and told her, talked about the risk of it. And like I said, I'm sure she she accepted it. You know, it was a dream for her and she felt it was that important to risk her life to do it. And God bless her for it. But, uh, it, it, you know, it's still like like now people are just thinking of nothing but success, nothing but success. SpaceX is is automatic. I mean, yeah, you see these rockets on SpaceX, ho hum. It's automatic. It's automatic. It's automatic. Well, the title of that blog is "Space is Hard," and that was an expression I heard used by some engineer after a rocket blew up that had an unmanned rocket that had every expectation as being as successful and as safe as any of the ones that are flying now. Everybody was shocked. It blew up, and he commented, "Space is hard," and people need to remember that it's not automatic. There's a thousand ways to die in space and on the rockets and the transportation to get you there. So people need to be aware of that. Fine. I mean, just be aware of it. I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing it. It's just everybody should should be aware of it. It is not risk free. Yeah. You should always have a twinge of nervousness watching a, watching a crude launch, right? Yeah. Actually, Shatner impressed me. He said when he was sitting out there, he was really nervous thinking around. He was voicing things I was <laughs> in my head when I was sitting on on discovery on my first mission, you know, hey. yeah. so he obviously wasn't in there thinking, oh, this is as safe as that set where we filmed Star Trek and the Klingons <laughs> are throwing their torpedoes at us. You know, he, he had some sense of the risk. It, it kind of haunted me because he was thinking he was saying he was thinking about death. And a lot of my friends were like, man, that's morbid. And I'm like, no, I'd be thinking about the same thing, too, yeah. because, you know, the, uh, uh, yeah, I'm well aware that that could be it. You know, <laughs> you should. I mean, anybody that gets on a rocket ought to have that sense. You know, exactly. I mean, even with a robust escape systems like SpaceX and uh, Blue Origin, you know, mm. those still can fail. So mm. space is hard. People just keep that in mind as they're watching these automatic, everything's successful. People come back and are Hollywood stars. You know, I was thinking about this actually recently because the uh, I mentioned you, Dad, I'm reading um, McCulloch's book about the Wright brothers. You know, it's interesting in the early phases of flight, they knew what they were doing was very risky and they never flew together, even though they had a two place airplane, because they were really concerned that if one of them got killed, that the the work would continue. And, uh, you know, I think there's a little bit of a parallel there to the extent that, mm. you know, that was the infancy of aviation. You know, we're certainly, I think still, if not in the first inning, we're, we're probably, I'm oh, sorry, an American baseball analogy, we're probably only in the second or third um, when it comes to space flight. And there's still a lot of learning to do, no doubt about it. So. You mentioned that the Challenger documentary, and I was actually surprised to say you watched it. Is it weird watching a, a big documentary about something that you were part of, it, like a, a, a program that you were part of, or a lifestyle? Or, or, you know, your families were involved and knew the people that were involved. What are your thoughts when that happens? When I watched it with my wife, I always it was really. Um, it was it, it was it was a walk down memory lane, and that sounds weird given that the 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 whole premise is somewhat sad. Um, but all of the old video of all these people, um, or a lot of the people anyway, that I knew as a kid, uh, either in passing or you know knew uh, Judy Resnick, obviously, um, since she flew with uh, Dad on his first mission. You know, I was more familiar with her than maybe some other people. Um, was was kind of cool and interesting to see, but um, it feels surreal to be honest. To answer your question, I um, if if anything, what I usually feel is that I wish I had paid more attention and appreciated the kind of living history that was happening at the time. I think this is a common thing for any young person or old person, for that matter. When you're in the moment, it's just life, and um, and you don't realize that 
that the world you live in has meaning to others. Um, and certainly as a, as a teenager, um, I don't think I, I, I sense it to some degree, but I don't think I sense it as, as much as I wish I would have at the time. Now that said, I don't know, you know, what would I have done differently? Would I have been keeping a very detailed diary? That's the only thing I can think of is maybe I would have done that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but otherwise, um, it was surreal is the answer, uh, but in, in a weird way, a nice kind of refreshing walk down memory lane. Pat, why don't you, uh, on that topic, why don't you tell them about the day challenge occurred in your high school and, and how that all went down? Yeah, so uh, I, I, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about this before because um, and it, it's, it, I always preface it by saying it's a little odd because, you know, Krista McAuliffe's school got so much attention uh, given the celebrity aspect of who she was and what she was doing. But it, but the impact of that school, frankly, was was small, really, relative to what it was like at my high school. So um, on the day of Challenger, I was sitting in a class um, and I got called to the principal's office and the, the uh, young lady who, who pulled me out was actually a neighbor of ours. Her name's Angela Cortero. Um, she had clearly been crying and I asked her what's wrong and she wouldn't, she wouldn't tell me. And by the way, I also point out that it's interesting that you know, one mile from the back gate of, of Johnson Space Center, where my school was, nobody was watching the launch that day. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was it, launches were what we did. And why was this any more special just because the teacher's on it? Nobody thought it was anything special to, you know, to watch. So um, in the long walk to the principal's office, because it's a large building, she would not tell me what was wrong. And I had convinced myself that dad had been killed because he was flying in T-38s training for his next mission. And he had been out in New Mexico and so I, I was stealing myself. I was so certain he had been killed because it, what else could it be, right? And when I got to the principal's office, um, he, you know, they had a TV out there and pretty quickly realized what had happened. He told me he had asked, and again, this is what's unique about my high school. He had pulled all the astronaut kids out of class to let them know what had happened so they wouldn't find out some other way. And so my high school, um, there were three kids who lost a parent that day. Um, you know, it's, it's really in, in a company town, effectively, where literally roughly half of the people who went to my high school, their parents worked for uh, NASA or one of its contractors. So it was really, really a, a, a very traumatic experience. Um, the last point I'll make on this, the other point I make in my book that's very interesting is, you know, I lived in a town here in Massachusetts. In fact, it's the 10-year anniversary this week of uh, 10 firefighters, or excuse me, five firefighters who were killed in a uh, warehouse fire. And, you know, it's a big deal. You know, these are people in the community. It's unusual to have that many people killed in one instance. And, you know, it was very sad for the town. And I point out that it's sort of like that, but there was one huge difference, which was nobody in the town felt responsible for the death of the firefighters. When Challenger happened, it was really clear that people went to bed that night wondering what did they miss? Because, you know, pilot error didn't cause Challenger, which meant it had to be a design flaw, which meant that the people who worked at JSC and Marshall Space Flight Center and other places ultimately had their fingers prints on this. Not, and I'm not saying that in, a, in an accusatory way, it's just a fact, right? And so I think, uh, I think for those reasons, it was infinitely more traumatic um, in the Houston uh, area I was in. And well, to answer your original question, Dave, about you know, when I see the videos, uh, you know, my response, um, I, I would guess I would use the word weird, it, it, but really it, it, what it does is it refreshes the pain. You know, I, as Pat described there, how painful the whole, thing was and uh, challenger and it just throws me back uh, to those days and how just so we were so happy and so thrilled that you know these missions are going so fast and it was it was just such a wonderful time and then uh, you start remembering at that very time when we're over the moon happy that the seeds were already planted it was going to happen uh, you know this o-ring design was flawed it was going to happen and we didn't know anything about that. And you just think, God, you know, it just, you know, if only we should, if only we could have known, you know, if it just something, uh, it, it just, it's painful as well. You, you relive the moments, you know, right before the, from the pinnacle of excitement and happiness. And now you're in the depths of despair to be going to memorial services for seven people. Uh, yeah. It's, I can't imagine what that's like. I, I, you know, I've had trauma in my life and I can't imagine then having to relive it again 20 years later because a documentary has been made about it because it well, won't, won't be made about it. Well, let me uh, make a point here. I'm glad they made it. I'm glad mm. that they made it. History, you know, that's history. People should never forget. Uh, in fact, it ought to be required viewing for the for anybody that's going into NASA. 
Hmm. Uh, not just the astronauts. I'm talking about everybody. Everybody should be uh, deeply familiar with the, the the failures that led that led to Challenger, both on a mechanical side and and the human side. And you know, it's, uh, in the end, it was a schedule driven disaster. You were asking a can do team like the Apollo team uh, to do something that was impossible to do with the limited resources that were that were given them. So, uh, you know, that was that's the, the tragedy there. Absolutely. Right. I, I have another question for, for Patrick. It, it kind of ties a few things we've talked about uh, together. Um, I'm wondering whether there is any bond that you have with other astronaut children. I, I've seen you um, re- react and comment on things with uh, Bruce McCandless the third, for example. Uh, I'm not. I don't know if you were friends. You would have been different ages. You probably wouldn't have been uh, close back then. But but clearly, uh, you had similar experiences. And I wonder going forward, do, do you ever get people reach out to you and say, "Hey, uh, my family member has become an astronaut." Have you got any experiences of, of how I can deal with this kind of thing? Or do you feel qualified to ever have that kind of conversation with someone? I just find it fascinating. It's such a small world of astronauts. I mean, there's only 600 people that have done it. There's not many families who have gone through this still. No, actually, it's an interesting question. Uh, and the truth is that really there there isn't any. Now, you know, as I said, I went to a very large high school and, you know, with, you know, your friends, um, to some extent, who your friends are can be influenced by your parents. But, um, you know, generally speaking, like any teenagers, you like who you like and who your parents are affiliated with really doesn't drive that. Um, in fact, probably it, like most teenagers, you're, you're picking people to drive your parents crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, like Bruce and I exchange emails now uh, every now and then. And um, But I met him through Space Hipsters. I've never met him face to face. Right. Um, so, uh, and it's been great by the way, because it is interesting. We've had some exchanges where clearly, and it makes your question actually very poignant in that regard. Um, he has a sense of the life I lived and I have a sense of the life he lived. Um, and look, it's not, I don't want to over dramatize it. You know, we were regular teenage kids with, with dads who did interesting things, but some of the aspects of those interesting things are definitely, definitely hit home. Like one of the things that he talks a lot about in his book that I can completely relate to is this obsession that anybody understandably who's selected to be an astronaut has with wanting to fly. And if you're not flying, you wonder what's wrong with you and how are they making the choices they're making and why isn't it my turn yet? Um, his dad had to suffer a lot more than my dad did in that regard. Yeah. Um, but but I could certainly relate to that and I understand how it got brought home. That's the only thing I really remember uh, uh, about you, dad, being frustrated. Like, I don't remember, um, you know, you talk about your um, you know, your view of women early on. I never remember you saying anything about that at the you know kitchen table or anything. But I do remember you stressing constantly about when the next flight would be. You know, uh, praying that every one that goes in front of the one your next schedule for goes off okay, so you can go. You know, all that sort of stuff. And that I got really clearly through Bruce's book, um, and that certainly I could relate to. I have never had uh, to the second part of your question though. Never had anybody reach out from like current crops of folks. To ask, and I think that's probably because there's communities that already exist that can, you know, that are more recent than I am, help with that. Laura uh, maintains a friendship and communication with Allison Smith, who was uh, Mike Smith, the pilot killed on Challenger. It was his daughter, uh, so they they maintain communication uh, from shared experiences in high school. I'll give you an example too, by the way, of uh, my daughter Laura wrote a blog a long time ago called "The Long Shadow of Challenger," and in it she talks about the impact it had on her personally. Uh, she was in the theater group at uh, Clear Lake High School, uh, the high school Pat went to. And the, the theater group is a close knit group of, of kids that are always rehearsing and always, you know, the drama plays that they put on and everything. And Allison Smith was part of that. And Laura, my daughter, was part of that. And of course, Challenger occurs. Uh, her father dies. Well, uh, I was flying on the second mission after Challenger, uh, two and a half years later. Uh, I was, it was a play that night and I was, had just landed from a mission, the uh, Atlanta SPS 27 before I was coming home and they put a huge banner inside the dressing room or something for, uh, uh, for me, uh, maybe it was outside, but it was said, uh, Mike Mullane went a long way to come to our play or something like that. And Laura said silently when she saw what they had done and would put it up, and Allison Smith is standing there in her brain. She was screaming, no, 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 don't you know? 
know, because she was felt so guilty. Her father is coming back safely from a mission and her father died on a mission. And it just, she's talked about how terrible she felt it was. It was just horrible that, that instant. And uh, it was surprising. I, I, I republished that somewhere and somebody sent me a note from NASA saying he's some manager somewhere. He was requiring every one of his new hires to read that to have a sense of the impact that these disasters have on families and how long lasting they can be, mm. uh, which I thought was pretty, <laughs> pretty interesting. But yeah, if challenger really did, did a number on everybody. And obviously the family suffered the most. Okay. Y'all, uh, <laughs> y'all made me cry. Y'all made a grown woman cry here. Wow. <laughs> I read that blog. I remember it. it, it yeah. It, it left a really huge impact on me as well, because as somebody on the outside, you don't think of things like that. You yeah. just don't. Well, I didn't know about it. I didn't know about it until she wrote the blog. I didn't know about it. Yeah. I'm a father. My kids never talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, I'll be uh, I'll be sending you a message through my next blog if you want to read it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. Okay. I'm, pr I'm probably going to start crying just asking this question. You guys did a talk at Space Fest together, which was uh, fantastic this year. And you said something, Patrick, at the end of the talk, you know, despite everything, you wouldn't exchange the experiences you had for anything I, I may be misquoting you but it was something to that effect do you yeah. still feel that way and oh and oh, yeah. you know the shared ex you know you guys had this you know father and son shared experience of you know kind of enduring the shuttle <laughs> shuttle yeah. era you know do you still feel the same way oh yeah absolutely i mean i think uh Obviously, having written the book and then spending time doing these things has made it even more awesome, to be honest, because, you know, get to do something a lot of people uh, don't get to do. And the story you're, you're talking about was when I was back in, uh, I was actually back in Houston for a high school reunion, which was really odd because, you know, I was like, I was one of the kids that left, like I left right after high school and didn't live in the area, never did. I was in the military. And so I came back. And so I felt, uh, to be honest, I felt a bit like a foreigner to all my classmates who a lot of stayed in the area and knew each other and were good friends and so forth. But I took the time to go to our, the home I grew up in, in Houston. And, um, I got the gumption up just to knock on the door and it turned out that I didn't realize this immediately, but the guy who answered turned out was the guy who bought the house for my parents. And this is 20 years later or so. And, um, and he invited me in to take a walk through the house and I couldn't resist. Right. It's one of those things where I haven't not seen it in so long. And, um, and he knew obviously that dad was an astronaut because he had bought the house from my folks. Um, but I was telling him stories um, that are I, uh, many of which I talk in my book, but you know, that, that, you know, there's a famous, famous, famous in the space hipsters community, a picture of the STS 41D crew wearing these shirts with these personas, um, you know, art on them where dad's Tarzan and Judy Resnick was Jane and so forth. And, um, and it's in our, it's a picture taken in our living room in that home. Uh, in fact, I might've taken that picture. I, I, I think I might, I, I seem to remember that, but I don't know for sure. I'll bet anyway, anyway, uh, because yeah, I don't I'll know who else would have. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, and then I remember times when Sally ride was over the house, you know, with the SCS 41 crew at the time she was married to Steve Hawley, who was on the mission and, you know, sitting under a pergola in the backyard, these guys having chips and beers at the end of the day. So I was, I was just telling this guy these stories and, and that, and that speech, you may remember, I got emotional talking about Emily, so no, no criticism of you doing it. But the guy said to me, wow, you had an amazing life. And I'm like, you know, it's funny, somebody else saying it to me made it more real to me than me just thinking it for some reason. And I said, man, you know, you're right. Like, and you think of this guy walking through and telling these stories about people who literally, like in the Sally Rides case, for sure, were national heroes that, you know, sat in this very ground. Um, you know, he thought that was cool and I thought it was very cool. So it was it, no, no change in my feelings on that at all. And it's been amazing. Yeah. And I'm the same way as Pat. I wouldn't Ooh. trade the experience for anything. I mean, there's highs and lows, obviously extreme highs and extreme lows, literally and figuratively. And, uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. My wife has an expression. She says, I wouldn't trade the experience for anything, but I wouldn't do it again for any amount of money, <laughs> <laughs> wow. but that, I would. I'd do it again. Uh, I was I was thinking about that when uh, when when Patrick said about taking the three generations up. I was like, I, I want. <laughs> I wonder what Mike's <laughs> wife feels about that. <laughs> the grandmother seeing husband, son, and grandchild all going <laughs> on one rocket. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, I I can guarantee. I hear her in there mumbling. <laughs> no way! No way did she go into that launch. 
Um, wow. Do you ever go to uh, the museums or go back to to the space centres and 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 get your own? Obviously, going around your own home is is a is certainly a kick. Um, but do you ever go along and get a nostalgia bug for it, or or, or do you have you got no interest in in that? Oh gosh, you know I love going back to KFC area and and uh, touring around. In fact, we were we had a family reunion there in July. I think it was July. And uh, what, what was awesome is. I have a friend of mine who's working the SLS program, gave us a tour of the SLS. And uh, Sean, you know, my grandson, Pat's son, is uh, working for SpaceX. And he got us this awesome tour of their Hangar X. And that that was save the day. I mean, uh, the SLS is gargantuan by any standard, but it's covered with gantry. You can't really see much. Uh, but it, obviously a huge rocket. Well, you walk into the SpaceX hangar and we had Sean leading us around. And here they got, they must have had, what do you think, Pat? 15 boosters yeah, laid 15, out? Yeah, 15, I was to say, yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and they're all sooted and covered with soot, like, uh, like the hangar deck on uh, Star Wars, you know, those uh, <laughs> fighters coming back all sooty <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> Space <laughs> is dirty, I guess. But uh, at <laughs> any, any rate, uh, it, was, it was literally like a science fiction film. Like the, the heroes are walking through there, all that. You know, one of these rockets is going to be taking uh, you into space. And uh, it was it was very nostalgic and connecting what my grandson is doing to what we did. You know, it just uh, actually that the, while that was cool, I thought the even cooler thing was he was able to get us out on the gantry at 39B. That's right. Um, and we wow. got to the top of the gantry, walked out on the access arm uh, for SpaceX and dad launched from that launch pad. Um, so wow. that that was really cool. It was really cool yeah. for me. <laughs> Yeah, seeing the flame bucket and all of that is uh, no, it, it it was it was it was great. Uh, by the way, all those rockets that were there, my wife was. And I mentioned this. My wife was the most obsessive compulsive person uh, for a neat freak, freak in the extreme. And these rockets are there, all sooty and dirty. And we had and everybody working in that hangar was under twenty five. I think they were all very wow. young. Yeah, it's but, very. Young. Uh, but these rockets, I asked her, I says, do you guys clean these things up between launches? You know, get, get dirty coming on those vertical landings for reuse, you know, all the plane going up. So they used to, but it took too much time and money to get them clean. So they just relaunch them dirty. And I, I told her, I said, if my wife was working here, not one of these would leave this hangar unless they were spotless. They were <laughs> clean. She didn't care how much money it cost Musk to do it. They, they would never go out on that launch pad without being absolutely spotless. It was great tour, though. Absolutely wonderful. Wow. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much for your time and for sharing these stories with us. And, uh, and yes, thank you. Giving us a bit of, uh, of insight into, into what that was like. It, this has been amazing. So thank you so much. Yes. Glad to do it. Glad to do thank it. You. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thank really you. appreciate the invite. Okay. You guys have yeah. a great, great holiday. Will do. You too. You too. Bye. Take Love care. Love you, mom. You too. Love you, mom. <laughs> Pat loves you. She says, who? <laughs> <laughs> She says she loves you. Okay. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Well, I feel like a sissy because I straight up started crying during that. I'm like, Jesus Christ, that was very moving. As somebody, oh my God, I'm about to start crying again. As somebody who grew up, you know, and with the shuttle program, who was, I mean, I was just obsessed with the shuttle program. That really just took me back. I mean, in a good way. Well, there was some un not fun parts about that time, but obviously, but uh, that really just took me back. That, that was really moving, especially with what, you know, Patrick was talking about going back to his old house and all the memories of the people who'd been there. And I'm like, man, that really just kind of hit me because I'm like, that was a really special time. I mean, it really, oh my God, that was really special. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, I how humble they both are uh, and just how they're just like us. But he was yeah. an astronaut. <laughs> you know, that's why we, we spent time with, with, with Mike twice now. But but you, you just feel like he's one of us, don't you? He's, he's, he's not uh, putting himself out there as being special and clearly he is, you know, to, to get to that point when he did. But yeah, you just feel so comfortable around them. Yeah, they're just regular people who just have that background, which is, I, and I find that honestly, 
about you know a lot of the some of the kids I've interacted with from um from the Apollo and the shuttle program. I've probably interacted more with the shuttle kids, um, only because you know we're a little closer in age, but um, they're just really normal. Like Bruce McCandless the third. That's another person we've interviewed. Hi, Bruce. Yeah. He's probably listening. <laughs> Um, that's another person that, you know, is just really just a normal person, you know, and and his dad was pretty normal, too. I have a Bruce McCandless story, and he was just the most humble, unassuming, you know, hey, is it OK if I can sit here person? And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. I really love that interview, though, although I feel like a sissy right now because I just started blubbering totally. Yeah. The, <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting Mike to bring up the documentary. And to say he watched it, I don't know why that really caught me out when he said that. I was like, oh, wow, you were living that. Why? You? <laughs> it just really caught me out. Yeah, I honestly didn't um, expect him to to watch something like yeah, that. Absolutely. Too many unpleasant memories, you know, of that time. But I think Mike Mullane, I, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I think he's a, a, one of those people that, you know, he understands that, you know, safety is real important. And that if it hadn't happened on that day, it was going to probably happen later that year. Yeah. So I think he understands, you know, that, you know, safety is just really <laughs> the priority, you yeah. know? Yep, yep, yep. I also loved how Mike described Krista McAuliffe in that when he was talking about her walking around with her smile and that she was already weightless. I thought that was just wonderful. But uh, that was a great interview. I really enjoyed it. Both Mike and Patrick are wonderful and I love how they bounce off each other. Of course, they both do both have books out, uh, Riding Rockets and uh, The Father, Son and Holy Shuttle. And we'll put links for those in the description in the show notes. Also, the full video, we had to take out quite a lot for this episode to, to get it to the right length. Uh, the full video of that interview is up on our Patreon page and there's some really great stuff, including some John Young stories. I know people love those. So uh, please do go and check that out. Or, or go and have a look at our Patreon page. You're pretty agile there, Twinkle Toes. You bet your uh, life I am. Since our last recording, there have been five launches into space with another six planned for the next week. But more on that next time. This week, we've seen one from China, two from Cape Canaveral in Florida, one from French Guiana, and one from Kazakhstan, which took three people into space and have now docked with the International Space Station. The commander was cosmonaut Alexander Mizukin, and inside the Soyuz capsule with him were two Japanese tourists, billionaire Isuku Maezawa and his video producer, Yozo Hirano. They intend to spend 12 days in orbit, and even though the two Japanese travellers are tourists, they are taking part in some scientific research, which is hoping to reduce health risks for future space travellers. The other notable launch, in my opinion, was the launch of the laser communications prototype, which we spoke about in last week's podcast. That went up on an Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral and as always, you'll be able to watch all of these launches and find out more about their payloads in our show notes, which you can find on our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com, or just check the link in the description of your podcast platform. As discussed in our interview with Mike and Patrick on Monday, NASA announced 10 new astronaut candidates. The 23rd group of candidates since the original Mercury 7 back in 1959. The 10 were selected from... 12,000 applications, and they now start two years of training joined by two candidates from the United Arab Emirates. NASA currently has 44 active members, and with the addition of this new class, NASA has selected 360 men and women to train as astronauts. The class had to be U.S. citizens with a master's degree from an accredited institution in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, or at least three years of related experience, or at least a thousand hours of pilot in command time and jet aircraft. The candidates also had to pass the NASA physical for long duration space flight. My application probably, I don't think it made it in the mail to them or something like that. They definitely, <laughs> they, yeah, they must, it must have not made it. No, I didn't even apply. I saw the application and the requirements and I was like, uh, yeah, there ain't no way I'm making that. I, I have zero flight hours in a jet aircraft. So I was like, nah, I think I'll not do it, but you know, maybe I'll get a chance someday on one of them SpaceX missions. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a good list. Again, we say this all the time, but you you go through the CVs of these people, and you're like, wow, 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 wow. All of them are so qualified. 
uh, and just amazing. <laughs> I'll have days, you know, where I'm like, man, I've accomplished a lot, a lot in, you know, 43 years. And then I'll read like their resumes and astronaut resume. And I'm like, never mind. I haven't done anything, man. Like, I feel like I'm standing still compared to these people. Seriously, um, there's uh, some incredible people on that. Uh, there's a, I know there's a medical person from SpaceX. Uh, there's a dr- somebody who's a driller from Alaska, which is really cool. So that kind of brings up the fact that on the moon, they're going to do geology. Yeah. So I thought that was really kind of neat. So I'm really excited to see what they're going to do in the future. Yeah, I think this is great. That that There's definitely a variety of backgrounds and expertise and, uh, and that really is getting me excited about the moon landings and, and, and the fact that they're going to go back with a complete different mindset. But I don't know if you saw this, but one of them used to cycle for the, for the U.S. national team, a decorated track cyclist for the U.S. national team, Christina Birch, which is crazy. There's already a rugby player. There's already a U.S. Uh, representative rugby player. Now we've got a cyclist as well. So next time I'm watching the Olympics, I'm going to be looking out for who I think should, uh, should be the next astronaut because clearly it's a happy hunting ground to find astronauts. I think as part of my fitness plan, I, I ate a burger today so i exercised <laughs> my i exercised my jaw that's really important it's really important yeah. if you don't eat yeah you're not gonna be able to do much you have a you have a point definitely <laughs> you have but a yeah, point that that is crazy but yeah another great group and uh looking forward to seeing what they all achieve at nasa absolutely Meanwhile, on the International Space Station, there was a six and a half hour spacewalk completed by Tom Marshburn and Caleb Barron to repair a 40 antenna. This has restored one of the ways the station communicates with the Earth. Now, following on from our chat last week with Dr. Alice Gorman about space junk, it is worth noting, and I think we mentioned this last week, that the spacewalk was delayed due to a debris cloud being nearby. But also, since that chat, the ISS has had to make another manoeuvre to lower its orbit slightly to avoid the remains of a Pegasus rocket, which was launched in 1996. The space junk problem is not going away. In other news, the Hubble Space Telescope is now completely operational again, and NASA has ordered enough booster rockets for the Space Launch System to see them through to Artemis 9. So that's pretty good news. Yes, great news. It was one of those really good day stories. When you hear it, you're like, ah, that's amazing. Because we've all heard so many times about how SLS might get cancelled and so on and so forth. But this just felt, yes, okay, this is good. Yep, we're doing it. We're yeah. go- we're gonna we're going for it. Yeah, the, actually, the, the 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 foot is not being taken off the gas, and I like that. Exactly. So, as always, you can find links to articles about all these stories in the show notes. That's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life. I guarantee you. So, Dave, did you do anything exciting this week? Well, it's funny you should ask, actually, because on <laughs> on Tuesday night I went to an evening with Tim Peake. Oh, awesome. How did that go? How did that go? It was amazing. So my my brother, for Christmas last year, he looked ahead at what events might be happening towards the end of this year, thinking that pandemic would be nearly over by then, uh, and uh, and saw this at his local theatre. So he got tickets for me, him, and my mum and dad. So the four of us, we don't do much, just the four of us anymore. Now my brother's been married for the last however many years, uh, and, and with kids and stuff. So it was really nice, the four of us, to go along. And... Although my mum listens to this podcast, hello mum, <laughs> my dad and my brother aren't people you would specifically think are interested in in space like like I am. Uh, and my brother said at the interval, he looked at me and went, I would never really choose to come to something like this, but I'm having a really good time. He's Tim is such a great talker. Uh, he did the whole thing with no notes. It was like wow. an, a two, uh, 45 minute sets I'll call them as a musician with, with a slideshow with images and video clips of, of various things he took you all the way through uh, his his life but mostly focused on the point where he joined ESA his training uh, build up to the launch time in space and then uh, and then coming back and and it was just wonderful and at no point was it too technical everyone in the audience could understand there was loads of kids there it was just a really good event and I'm pretty sure it's done in a capacity as an ESA person because he had his uniform on and all that kind of stuff. And it was, a, it was just a great outreach moment. And when you see someone like that stand there and deliver this presentation and connecting with that many people, I mean, you're talking, there was about 1,000 people in there, I reckon. Wow. 
probably more than that. That's awesome. And this is a this is a tour he's been doing around the country. It just you're just thinking that he's having such a huge impact here in this country. And I know we've mentioned that before, but he really is. He's really embracing the idea that he knows he has a responsibility to to keep reaching out and trying to inspire people uh, beyond. And we we say this about many astronauts, but in the UK. He's our only active astronaut. He's the only guy that's been to the International Space Station and, and so on and so forth. So it, it's a big deal, and he, he just came across really well. So uh, if anyone ever gets the opportunity to see Tim at one of his events, make sure you go because you won't regret it. That is awesome. I'm really excited you got to do that. And I've never met Tim Peak, but I've heard he's really awesome. So that is really cool. That is so cool. Yeah. He just comes across as such a nice guy. You, you Always, always comes across as a great guy. So, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, that's all we've got for this week. Thank you very much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. And a big thank you to all of our Patreons for your continued support. Don't forget, you can join the party at patreon.com forward slash space and things. And thanks to everyone who continues to share the podcast. It really means a lot. But don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.